Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, what wondrous love do we know because of Christ our Savior. May His love fill your heart this day and all days. Please join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, You have shown us greater love than we can imagine. You have shown us Your love, not only in word, but in action, by giving Your life for us on the cross. Help us each day to be humbled in that beautiful truth, to know that You did it for us, so that we might be with You forever. Lord, help us each day to be ready to share that truth, so that all may know what wondrous love You have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, it seems like it's already almost a forgotten memory, but many of you, like me, watched this year's Super Bowl. February 7th. I know, we're not even a month away, but probably most of you have forgotten any of the significant plays. But you do hopefully remember that there were two quarterbacks lining up against each other. Both, whether or not you like them, talented quarterbacks. Peyton Manning, who's been in the league since 1998, played several years for the Colts, made a name for himself. On the other side, you have Cam Newton, a young upstart, graduated from Auburn who, after winning the Heisman, after being successful in winning the national championship, leading the Carolina Panthers. And whether or not you enjoyed the game, you have to admit again that these players were talented. Many, much of Carolina's success was owed to Cam Newton, so they said. His gifts as a quarterback. They said that he led them to that 15-1, to 15-1 record, only losing to the, the Falcons. Sorry, I always go to the, the other name for them in my mind, which is not a church name. But only losing to that one team. But, you know, during the season, they played a team, the Tennessee Titans. And the Tennessee Titans on November 15th uh, well, Cam did a great job and ran it in, and he had this long end zone dance. Well, two of the Titans players really did not care for it. They said that it was taunting, and so they got up in, in Cam's face and were telling him why it was wrong. And, well, that probably doesn't surprise any of you, because most of the teams seem to have players who do their end zone thing. Whether it be a dance in the end zone, a pointing to heaven, or even diving into the stands. Well, these players told them that they didn't like it. And his response was, if you don't want me to do it, then don't let me in. Now this happened November 15th. It kind of stuck with him the rest of the season. If you don't want me to do it, then don't let me in. Well, back to the Super Bowl. Denver did a good job of not letting him in. Uh, if, you know, if you watch the game, you know that Denver pretty much stopped all of Carolina's offense. Following the game, Cam said this. He said it had very few words following the game. Who likes to lose? He was downtrodden. He was despondent. But he did respond, who likes to lose? Good question, don't you think? Who likes to lose? Do any of you like to lose? Don't all raise your hands at once. <laughs> we don't like to lose, do we? We love to win. We like to be on the winning side, whether it's doing well in our academics at school and being successful, having a grade A paper, or whether it be in our marriages, having a successful marriage and, and family that we can celebrate, or whether it's just in our business world, where being successful in the companies we work for. We don't like to lose. We love to win. I love to win. I don't know about you, but I like to win in people liking my jokes. I like them to laugh. My poor wife will admit, though, that she doesn't always laugh at my jokes. And you all don't either, and it's okay, because they're not always funny, are they? <laughs> I like people to like me. I want them to say, well, he's a pretty smart guy. Have you ever been in the room, though, thinking you are the smartest one and then been knocked down a few pegs? I like people to think that I'm a pretty spiritual guy. On the other hand, though, I know I'm no Martin Luther. We like to win, don't we? And on one hand, it's okay to want to be successful. It's okay to want to win, to do well, to use the gifts, talents, and abilities God has given you because they are God-given talents and abilities. But a lot of times, deeper than that desire to win, is maybe an attitude of superiority. 
Maybe even an attitude of arrogance or conceit. This attitude that, well, people should laugh at my jokes because I am funny. People should recognize me as a spiritual leader. But that's, that's not the right attitude at all. And unfortunately, that's not just the attitude of the world. But we see that attitude predominant in the church as well. We see that attitude in the way that we treat one another. Don't tell me that there aren't cliques here at this church. Sometimes after church where you get together and you talk to only the same three or four or five people. Don't tell me that all of you know every single member's name. Or whether or not everybody is a member. We like to think here at First Lutheran and Circle of Love that, that we are the most friendly church, the greatest church in Manhattan Beach. But is that the right attitude to have? You know, Paul, writing to the church in Philippi, said, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. He also said to the church in Galatia, let us not be conceited. Jesus himself said in the Gospels, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. It seems like all those, all the New Testament, even the Old Testament, points it up to a different attitude. More of an attitude of embrace. An attitude of loving one another. Being together, walking together. We come together as sinners to receive the sacrament. We come together as the people of God to support each other, knowing that we, none of us are better than the other. And the only reason we have salvation is Christ alone. We come together recognizing that although we have different back, backgrounds, we're all in need of salvation through Christ. And unfortunately, though, knowing that and practicing it are two different things. Living out our faith and living out humility, recognizing whose we are, is not always easy for us. In our gospel reading for this morning, John chapter 4, it's one of my favorite gospels. Well, one of my favorite stories in the gospels, I should say. Here we have the text that's so often referred to as the, the woman at the well. Not much is told about this woman at the well. We find out that she's got a bit of a scandalous lifestyle. She's a Samaritan. She lives in the small town of Sychar, but beyond that, we don't know much about her. You all might not know this, but in those days, in case you didn't catch it in the Scriptures, Samaritans and Jews didn't get along. Jews looked at Samaritans with a superior attitude. They were the chosen people after all. You couldn't touch a Samaritan without becoming unclean. One example of superiority. Women. You have to know that when the disciples went into Sychar to buy bread, they would have walked right past this unnamed woman at the well. In that day and age, Women didn't speak to men. Only men would speak to women. Men seemed to have a superior attitude. Another example of superiority. And then there's Jesus. Son of God. Respected teacher. And he shows this attitude of superiority too, right? No. The one who could have lorded it over this woman of loose morals. Instead, he treats her with kindness, with love, with compassion. Here this woman, not only was she a Samaritan, was she a woman and, 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 and treated poorly by, by others, but even her own community. Why do you think John is so specific when he tells that she came at the sixth hour? She was coming at the sixth hour, the heat of the day, because no one else would be there. None of those other judgmental eyes would fall upon her as she went to do what she had to do to provide for herself and her family. 
And then you get Jesus. Jesus doesn't immediately say, woman, what is wrong with you? Why do you have such a lifestyle like this? He doesn't tell her, I'm the Son of God, and how dare you approach me? He says, could you get me a drink? He shows her a different attitude than she'd been used to. He shows her love and compassion instead of that judgmental attitude. And that's transformative in her life, isn't it? Because once Jesus asks her for that drink and tells her of the living water, which certainly intrigued her, what happens next? He says, go, go tell your husband. He knew what was coming. There is a little bit of law in this story. But after that, she goes and tells the whole town about this Messiah, about this Christ. The love of God transforms hearts and lives. Jesus, of all people, of all, could have been the superior, could have been the Lord who condemned and judged and instead showed her love. And that's really contradictory to our world today. It really contrasts the world that we live in today, even the churches that we go to. Because in the churches, even in the world we live in, we find an attitude of judgment. An attitude of lording it over one another. That superiority. We look and we see those people who push their shopping carts down Manhattan Beach Boulevard and Sepulveda and it has all their worldly goods in them. You've seen them. Don't tell me you haven't. And what do we do? Do we go up to them and ask them how life is going? If there's something that they could use for help. Or do we immediately veer our car the opposite direction when we're going into the Target parking lot? Would we even deign to go across the tracks to those dangerous places? The other side of the tracks where we might not want to reach out our hands. Or if we do, we have our hand sanitizer ready to wipe off any destitution or any, any of that scum. Unfortunately, that attitude of superiority continues to live in the church. It doesn't have to be people who are of lower income than we are, in a different socioeconomic bracket than we are. What about the people who speak differently than we do? Well, we'll only talk to them if they speak English to us. The people who look differently than us, that don't have the necessarily the same skin color as we do, even in the 21st century, how often do we still see racism existing, even in the church? Jesus gives us an example, not of superiority, but of humility. He gives us an example of love, not judgment. He gives us an example of compassion. An example that, well, we should follow. We know it's impossible to follow perfectly. So sometimes we just write it off. Well, maybe tomorrow I'll fix this. Maybe the next day it'll be better. Is that the attitude we should have, though? Jesus gives us that example of humility. That example that transforms lives. Because our love as imperfect as it is, can be made perfect in Christ. First John says this. First John tells us that it is not our love that is perfect, but it is made perfect when Christ lives within us. When Christ, whose perfect love, dwells in our hearts, we might show that perfect love to others, even in an imperfect world. And that love, as we read in Romans chapter 5, it came to us poor, miserable sinners, while we were yet sinners. While you were yet sinners, Christ died for you. While you yet stank of your sin, were corrupted by your sin, Christ died for you. Not one of us can call and, to, and tell the Lord that we deserve to be part of His kingdom. We deserve to be allowed into His tabernacle. But because of Christ, with open arms, He welcomes us. I love to see a couple of texts 
in the Gospels that really speak to this. Luke chapter 15. You all know the story. Maybe not the address yet, but 99 sheep are in the fold. And there's that one who's wandered off. That one who's wandering on its own. Christ died for that one. He went after that one. Whether it was you or me or someone who isn't even in the church today. Christ died for that one person so that they might be part of the flock. So that they might be brought into the kingdom. So that they might enjoy eternal life with each and every one of us. Christ died for them and for each one of us. So that we might together as the people of God, we might together worship and praise Him. We might together receive that sacrament. We might together live out our faith in this world. Recognizing that every person has the same need we do. To hear the love of Christ. Because the love of Christ transforms broken hearts and broken lives. The love of Christ transformed that woman at the well that day. The love of Christ transformed each one of you that you might call Him Father in heaven. The love of Christ continues to work this day, in this world today. As we go out these doors, it could be easy to have an attitude of superiority. But as we talk about those things we need to give up, that attitude of superiority is one of them. Because it only gets in the way. It creates barriers, blinders, so we can't see the greater need. Give up that superiority. Christ invites us to humble ourselves, confessing our sins, and He will forgive us. Dear people of God, when we humble ourselves, we recognize that it is not us, but it is the love of Christ that transforms us. May His love transform you today and each day as you walk with Him. Amen. Please pray with me. Oh Lord, at times I am arrogant and conceited. I adopt an attitude of superiority. And I confess this before you. Each of us at times has this attitude of conceit, superiority. We confess these sins before you. Remind us, O oh Lord, of your gracious forgiveness. Reassure us that through Christ's sufferings and death on the cross, we are forgiven and we are made whole. That even now you are transforming us, working in our hearts and our lives we might know the joy of eternal life. That it's not only for those who look like us, speak like us, are in the same socioeconomic bracket as us, but it is for all people. For you have opened your kingdom to all because of Jesus' sufferings and death. Lord, help that message fill our hearts. Help it fill our lives. So that as imperfect as our love is, it may be made perfect by you. This we pray in the name of Jesus, who loves us, who cares for us, who walks with us. Amen.